Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Rosalis Peel. We're going to talk about her book, Mike and Me, and Mike was her husband. And we're talking about living at home with Alzheimer's, which I know a lot of people are dealing with right now. So thanks for joining me, Rosalis. Thank you, Jennifer. It's fun to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about your husband first. Oh, gosh. You know, you get a wife talking about their husband. We can go on forever. But uh, he was a great guy. He lived till age 76. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2002, died in 2011. And uh, he'd been in law enforcement for many years. And uh, fortunately, he brought a good sense of humor into this illness with him. And uh, figured out how he could maintain a pretty pleasant attitude. And that was huge for both of us. It's definitely important. I've learned over the last two years of podcasting that one, there's a huge difference between spouses that are caregiving and adult children who are caregiving. Yes. My mom always said, well, I don't want to be a burden to you girls. Right. Uh, right. Oops. And And I have to say, you know, when he first got the diagnosis, he was pretty grumpy for a while. It actually took a while to bring that back around, you know, I'd say months. And then we kind of resolved that one day in the yard and we just had this real honest conversation that he was concerned about leaving me in our home. And so we said, well, let's, I think we can do this at home. We'll just see how this goes. And uh, he made a, a real definite decision right then. He said, well, let's get on with it. And he really <laughs> had an attitude change, which was a blessing for both of us. Well, definitely living with fears is not good. And Alzheimer's is fearful enough, and if you think that maybe your loving spouse is going to just dump you in some some place, which I don't, I've never met anybody that's done that, you know, but I think it's a legitimate concern a lot of people have. I could see well, being grumpy. Yeah, and I just didn't realize that was his big, con- big concern. Mine was worried about, would he get lost? Would he take car keys? Would he get hurt? Would he still know me at the end of life? So we really had two different agendas and I didn't realize it till we had that heart to heart talk. And then we just, you know, kept moving year by year to see how this worked out. And it turned out that we were able to stay at home. So what kind of things did you guys do that made that possible? Oh gosh, you know, I was thinking about that. And I think uh, tuning into him and who he was, was a big deal. Um, I think we learned how to handle anger you know, and that was a pretty positive thing to know how to do that. I was kind of thinking of key points, you know, that might be helpful for people, especially now staying at home. So I think the anger issue was important. I think uh, me learning that I could still be a wife and a caregiver, that was another one, which, you know, I wasn't sure of. And then I think the other one that became just huge is that he continued to know me till the end of life. And I didn't know any of those things were possible when we started. And particularly that last one, I had a great fear that he wouldn't know me as time went on. And I could do this, but when he didn't know who I was, uh, that was going to make it a little bit tough. So he, he, kept, he remembered your actual relationship the entire time? Well, that was kind of an amazing thing to me. I think that happened because we did lots of little things that helped that. And a couple of those things that helped out a lot is I came back to our wedding album. You know, that was a a good thing to do, telling stories and reminding him of, you know, um, our stories and what we did and who we were. And literally, I would take our wedding rings and clink them together to just, you know, kind of say, hey, we go together. And that was helpful. So bringing him back to those memories was a big thing. And then I think actually staying in our home was helpful, you know, just because in our home, we had all the same things here. We had the family photos and, uh, people coming by who knew him, all those things, you know, kept him on track with who we were. And uh, yeah, we were lucky that way. I didn't know if that would happen or not. Matter of fact, it was kind of funny. I talked to a caregiver, Sabina helped us the last year of life. And we were in the kitchen talking as she was going out the door. And she said, I I said, I can do this as long as Mike still knows who I am. That's my greatest fear is what that's going to be like. And she said, well, that doesn't always happen. And I went, what? I mean, I was into this nine years and I had no idea he could still know me. And actually part of my background is I'm an RN and a parent educator and couple relationship person. So I I knew a lot, but I had no idea 
even nine years later, that maybe he would still know me. And uh, so I, I, I like to let other people know that's possible. My mom always thought I was her best friend. She'd that's not that. a bad place to be in. <laughs> no. And the, what was funny is, you know, looking back now, she always told everybody, oh, this is my best friend. I've known her for a really long time. So I'd be like, yeah, you think? Like maybe 53 years or 52 <laughs> years, depending on which birthday I had just passed. But she, she was really resistant to help. Now, maybe you don't get help from your friends. She didn't want to be a burden to my sister and I. So she didn't want the girls to help, although she did kind of sort of forget she had daughters this past Thanksgiving. So this would have been Thanksgiving 2019. was driving her to my house to switch out her, her summer clothes for the winter clothes, which I know we're in Northern California. You guys don't think we need to do that, but <laughs> we kind of do. And especially when you want to keep their closet with as little visual clutter as possible. Yes, yes. And she was, I kept saying, what would you like to do for Christmas? Well, blah, blah, blah. And she'd bring up my, her husband, quote my dad. And I'd say, oh, okay, well, I know what he wants to do. What do you want to do? And yes. I could never get a straight answer. And, she's, and I said, well, do you want to spend Thanksgiving with your daughters? And she's like, I don't have daughters. It was like, oh, good Lord. <laughs> like, it's exhausting as a caregiver. It's a really tough, tough role. And I don't know if it equates quite the same, but that was one of the challenges for us is could I be a caregiver and could I be a wife? And I would flip that to you. Can you be a daughter and can you be a caregiver? You know, and how do you maintain those lines that you're both? And I think, you know, that's possible as long as you keep that relationship as positive as you can. And if you can keep the relationship on track and if you don't get overburdened as a caregiver. So there's a chapter in the book that's called, Care can you be a caregiver and a spouse? And the first thing I talk about in there is I had to take care of me. And I'm sure you relate to that. Because if you as a caregiver get burned out, I mean, if you're giving too much time and too much energy, then you get snappy and you get irritable and you're not pleasant and you haven't done anybody a favor. So. I had to really build in, especially later as the disease progressed and he was pretty high need, I had to build in every day time for me. And that usually was if I got up before him, you know, I could take a few minutes and journal or have a cup of tea on my own. Or if I snuck it in at night, it was I got him settled, then I liked a hot bath at night. But if I didn't get that little time away from him just for me, I was I was pretty grumpy and I really didn't want to do that. So I think to keep those roles separate, I had to take care of me and not get burned out. I, I'm assuming that kind of fits for you that you could get overburdened with your mom at times. Yeah, especially in the last three months. There were, because she was so combative, you know, I was always trying to find a solution to that because she'd drawn blood on caregivers and my husband. And, you know, that's not good. You know, one, you don't want your mom to act like that. I knew she would not that would not be something that she would do. She might threaten it, but she wouldn't actually go right. through with it. Right. And yeah. so I, I think I've realized in the last, it's been three weeks today since she passed away, that I think she was always on my mind subconsciously. It was yes. trying to find, like my yes. poor brain was just spinning like a hamster wheel yes. trying to find solutions. And, you know, in, I'm going to back up into the anger. But first I wanted to ask, I have two friends One's caring for her dad. One is caring for her husband. The husband um, basically has early onset Alzheimer's that was essentially triggered from um, traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. And both of these men that these women are caring for, for lack of a probably more appropriate term, are really clingy. So like the, the husband follows her everywhere. It's exhausting. Yeah, that's exactly her problem. I mean, I think, you know, with this, you know, stay at home, <laughs> stay at home mandates. I'm not sure that this woman is not going to tie him to a tree because, you know, she's, he had cancer and I mean, they've, they've just been through the ringer and, you know, she's still getting wrung out. So how, do you have any suggestions for how you can get 10 minutes to yourself when they're right. you trying to get them settled over here and they realize, Oh, it's like my, my old man dog. Right. He's a total mama's boy and, is, and he can't hear anymore. And as soon as he realizes I'm out of the room, he literally races around the house looking for me. 
Right. And I guess I left one day and he woke up and literally raced around the house kind of in a panic. I don't think he was panicking, but it was like, where is she? Where is she? Where is she? And my husband's like, she left <laughs> and he's deaf. So it's like, you can't talk to him. So <laughs> I've gotten in the habit now before I leave the room or if I'm definitely going to leave the house, I just, I like let him know, like, hi, right. <laughs> mama's leaving. Well, I, Don't panic. There's, there's so many things that pop in my head as you say that I'm hoping I'm holding them all, but, um, the following around the house, I just want to slip in something about routine. You know, routine is a big deal. And the routine and sleep made a difference in anger in our house. I mean, that was an absolute because Mike would frequently lose it, you know, get angry and get upset when he was tired, which is just a reminder about the brain, you know, especially with Alzheimer's, you just need that brain to rest. It's overworked. It's working so hard at everything. So if you can give it you know, a rest. He always did better after a rest in the afternoon. He did better first thing in the morning. So I had to learn that he needed real breaks. He needed a real nap in the afternoon. And that meant, you know, you go in the bedroom, you crack the bedroom door, you turn on the special music, the shoes are off, the special blankets on. Sometimes I would lay down with him so that he would, you know, have that little rest. And then I could slip away. So for the following routine, you know, somebody's following you around. I could handle that if we had that rest, if we had a routine, if I knew, okay, this is what we're doing this morning. He's with me every moment of the day, but we're heading for the barn here because soon it's a nap time. And literally, I had to learn that those naps increased as the disease progressed. At first, it was an afternoon nap. Later, before he got out of bed, you know, breakfast in bed, medication, which meant then he did better when I got him up. But that was just enough for him, you know, because maybe he had sort of a mini bath in bed too. Then he really needed to just roll over, take a nap for about an hour before I got him up. And then he could get up much easier because he had his medication. So the following around, you know, uh, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's has all different stages. So it depends upon the stage. But I think routine was huge, which can include, you know, sit here at the kitchen counter I'm going to get a book and we're going to read. Hang on to the book. We're going to read in just a minute. You sit right here. I'm going to come and read with you. So they know there's a reading time and there's a routine. And I think that eases it. And if nothing else, if you can get some naps in there and you just kind of know that's your break. The one that I related to and it kind of came to mind when you told this story is Mike had a time when he would yell for me whenever he was out of the room. I was out of the room. That I thought was gonna take me over the edge. I mean, I could not go brush my teeth, answer the phone without him yelling. And once I figured it out, it was literally that his cognitive abilities at that time were such that he couldn't figure out that I was still there if he didn't see me. And once I realized he's yelling because he can't see me, you know, he just doesn't have that ability. And I actually put one other part on that and I recognized what that was about was that he still loved me. You know, he was still very connected to me. And instead of being upset by it, I recognized it as a nice gift. That helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you said, you said a couple of other things in there that I wanted to pick up on, but that following around is the one that kind of stuck with me most. Yeah, the, the one gal that's caring for her husband, she she's struggling with that and he's, he's still in the stage where he's aware of mm -hmm. his problem. Right. Um, I think, you know, the other thing that falls in there is, you know, it's so easy to recognize what's not going well. And if you can flip it around and recognize what's going, you know, I mean, you see what's wrong, you know, you can be in, you can, you see the wrong things like he's following me around all the time, as opposed to he still cares for me and flip it around and recognize we still have a connection, you know, once you flip it and recognize, you know, this, this isn't going to go on for long. I mean, Mike stopped yelling for me and when he stopped yelling for me. It was like, you know, it was exhausting for the months it went on. It went on for a few months, but then I missed it because he wasn't talking like he had been before, you know, that ability had gone. And so eventually when the husband can't follow you around, it's like, you miss that he's not beside you. He can't do that anymore. So I know that's not easy to do when you're in the middle of it, but it does help once you put it in that perspective. 
I might not have enough distance, but people always said, my mom had one story she would tell all the time. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and I still don't want to hear it. You know, even if I, you know, could hear her say it, I still don't want to hear it. So, but it's probably has, I probably haven't had enough distance yet. There'll probably right. become a time where I'm like, oh, I really wish I heard that story my mom started with. I've had dogs all my life and blah, blah, blah. So what I'm wondering, Jennifer, were you able to find things that connected you to her with good memories? I mean, were you able to pull up things that you could say to her that remember when we did this or when we did that and, and kind of pull back to being a daughter and memories? Do you feel like that happened or not? No, but we did things like we would go and watch kids play in the park. Nice. We were, we were serious creepers. We'd go watch kids in the pool. Nice. <laughs> Yes. So, you know, we did things together that I don't think, like, I will never forget the time when, let's see, she moved out in 2018, I think. Sounds right. There was a time when there was my mom, who was Diane, and the other Diane, and the other other Diane. <laughs> there were three <laughs> of them, and they all hung out together. So mm -hmm. three Dianes is confusing enough for people whose minds are fine, but when you have three of them whose minds are not fine... <laughs> It is a serious <laughs> joke because you'd say, I would ask her one day, oh, where's your friend, Diane? I'm Diane. I know you are, but you're a friend, you know, the one, blah, blah, blah. Hi. You know, and so I just, it was just funny, but it was easier sometimes if I actually took my mom and other Diane out. Yes. And yes. I took them to a regional park and there's a big cave. It's a sand mine cave. <laughs> People were like, and you brought them back? And I said, and I, and it was literally, I didn't know it at the time. Um, the other Diane was getting very paranoid and causing problems, I guess. And I don't, I never met the, I think I met the daughters once. So I showed up and she'd moved out. They'd moved her out. I don't know if she'd caused a problem or I, I don't know the circumstances mm -hmm. for moving her out. So then, then we just had Diane and the other, other Diane. But I had taken my mom and this and the first Diane to the regional park and they just sat there and they talked about the trees and some random children. I didn't I have no clue if they were real or not. And there was kind of a steep drop off to a path that only brave people would slide down to get to this path. It, you know, if you went around, you know, there was a safe way to get there and then there was the slide down the hill on your rump. And they were talking about that and how they wouldn't let the kids near it by and I just sat there and listened to them. And it was, I was able to be relaxed and enjoy their bizarre memories. Yes. I'm not sure they were going down memory lane. I don't yes. know where they were going. And yes. I took pictures of them together and nice. individually. And nice. I looked at those right after mom passed away. And I'm like, you know, that was a pretty good afternoon, even if I did bring them back. Well, and I think that's what you're looking for. You're looking for the golden moments, you know, what are the treasures? And in fact, you know, for people who are journaling, journaling during the process, you actually want to write them down because you can forget them. And I think with people staying at home now, you can still find them. You know, what we're doing right now on computers is a big deal. And I've had some nice interactions with my grandchildren on Zoom. And I know even in care facilities, it's incredible how people are able to visit through a window or do FaceTime and you know, stay, stay connected. And actually we're creating new memories. You know, you mm -hmm. want to keep memories. So you had memories before. Now these are different memories. And well, I have, that was a beautiful memory you created with your mom and her friend, Diane. Yeah. Well, the other Diane, it was so funny. Um, she was better mentally than my mom was, but she has declined a lot. She doesn't even acknowledge my existence anymore. But prior to this, I had was taking my mom to get her nails done. One, because it was just easier to have the professionals trim them and polish them and do all those nice things. And other, other Diane said, oh, can I come too? And it was like, oh dear Lord. <laughs> and Am so I, I up thought, for you know, so I thought, okay. You know, fortunately the nail place was literally like five minutes away by car. If, if that, if there was no stoplights, it would probably have been two. And so I'm like, okay. And I'm like, this one wants to go with me. I don't have a problem with it. Do you guys have a problem with it? I mean, the staff there knew me really well. And they, their first response was like, oh yeah, no, that'd be nice. Oh wait, we better call her family. <laughs> and they did. And her family 
they they felt guilty. They're like, well, how do we pay? I'm like, don't worry about it. It's like, what, 20 bucks for a manicure? It's no big deal. You know, do something nice for my mom one of these days. And so I, I feel like I did something really nice for the other, other Diane yes. and for her family that I never met. Yes. So, and I think, you know, those are the golden moments, which now you recall and, and remember them fondly. And for people who are staying home, I think this is one of the big challenges. You know, there's a group of people who are wanting to do this at home, knowing they always had the safety net of a care facility, which they don't mm -hmm. feel like they have as much as they did before for fear that maybe if they have their loved one go in a care facility, they can't visit them. And at home, they've lost the nice advantages of having, you know, sons, daughters, people come over and help them, friends stop in, places they could go. They can't even go for manicure with their partner like they used to. So I think it, it kind of lends itself to a whole different set of challenges. I think even couples, when they're not dealing with Alzheimer's, it's a challenge right now. So I think those golden things you can build in at home, you know, that create that nice part of your relationship. I, wrote down a couple of notes and I just want to make sure I don't forget some of the things I said that uh, it was important. Oh, here's another one I want to mention in relationships, which you can do at home so easily. And certainly you could do with your mom. It'll actually be fun to hear if you did it or not. It's that old thing of departures and reunions. We all forget about that. When you first start going out with somebody, you give somebody a hug and a kiss. When you see them, you give them a hug and a kiss when you leave. And then you forget about that, you know, time goes by and your partner comes in and you kind of wave to them as they come in and maybe you're cooking or watching a show and you don't have a real, you know, reunion and departure. And that's something we know that helps relationships. So I want to, you know, shout that out to people who are home with your loved one before they go to bed at night and make sure you have a hug and a kiss when they get up in the morning, do the same thing. If they're lucky enough to have a care provider who comes in, to help them out a little bit. And I know some people are still getting that. So if they have somebody who comes in, if they can, they want to step away and actually take a walk in the neighborhood to have a real break instead of multitasking with the care provider. We had a great person offered to us from hospice who did a bath for Mike one day a week. And so when she would come, I literally would have a good 30 minutes, which I usually did with our dear friend, Betty, but I didn't have to. And I think in this particular situation, if people could step away, it'd be great. And of course, you would want to say goodbye to your loved one. I'll be right back and give them a kiss. And when you come home, do the same thing. So did you, you and your mom do hugs and kisses or how did that work for you guys? I always gave her a hug. We weren't super kissy as a family. And because she thought I was her best friend, that's pretty weird. <laughs> right. It's hard sometimes to remember because there would be situations where it's like, you know, this is kind of like out, but then when I would remember, oh yeah, I'm her best friend, and this is how mom acted with her best friends, and she tells everybody I'm her best friend. I mean, she makes it a point to tell people, I, or she did. Um, so I'd always give her a hug, and I learned really early on, say, I'll see you tomorrow. And because Perfect. her, Perfect. yeah, because if I told her, okay, I'll see you next week, that was way too long. That That didn't have much meaning. Right. And... The, my biggest challenge with departures and reunions was, God forbid you go to the bathroom, because she right. would forget we'd been there. If I could be there for two hours, go into the bathroom, come out and say, okay, you know, now I, get, now I gotta go back to work. Or what I, I learned kind of later on in the three years that she was in the care residence to not say that I was going home, but say I had to go back to work. Because mm -hmm. I would get the guilt trip if I was going home but if I had to go back to work, she'd be like, oh, do you really? Oh, that's a bummer. So it was a different emotional feeling for her, for me to be leaving for a reasonable reason versus right. just leaving. <laughs> so you did that. You did departures mm -hmm. and reunions, which was really nice. As I look at my little notes here, another one I notice is you don't want to do criticism, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's so hard not to do that because unfortunately people with Alzheimer's can be doing lots of things that make you want to be critical, but we know that doesn't change the situation. If you catch them doing something right and you tell them what they're doing right, then you get more right, you know, instead of telling it wrong. My favorite one is, you know, as time progressed and I'd ask Mike to, you know, raise a right arm to put a shirt on or something and the left foot would go up. You know, it was so hard not to say, no, no, that's not the, I don't want the left foot up. And I really had to learn to just praise him for, 
good, you know, you're doing a good job here. Because he was trying to help me. He just had the wrong extremity, you know. And so if I could just say, oh, good, thanks for helping me, you know. Uh, it made a big difference instead of being upset with what he got wrong. And that, again, that's just couple relationship information, like hugs and kisses, tell your partner what they're doing right. And I think the same thing applies for long-term relationships. So just another whole topic we've, we've kind of glossed over and I want to come back to it a little bit. It's that whole topic of anger. Mm -hmm. A few things in couple relationships that really fit for Mike and I, and it's fun to bounce them around with you to see if any of them fit or not. But one of the things I already mentioned, which was sleep, you know, sleep was a big deal. If we got that under control, then there were far less out outbursts. I would say almost virtually every time he got upset, I could relate it to, it's the end of the day, he's tired. It just didn't happen when he got up and he was rested. But the other one I just want to mention is laughter. Because, you know, laughter is a big deal if we can see the funny side of things. And so Mike actually was laughing one day out by the TV and I went to check it out. And he was listening to a taping for Victor Borga. You know, he does that funny piano thing. And so we ordered the CD. Gosh, we played that a lot, you know, in the years to come because he'd laugh out loud with it. And he liked old I Love Lucy stories, you know, the old comedy and he'd laugh. And so if we could have some laughter, that helped both of us. I mean, literally endorphins are secreted in your brain when you have laughter. And so I, I remember once he came into my office and he had his boxers on backwards. And he said, oh, this is the best one yet. <laughs> and we both started to laugh. So, you know, if you can pull that out. Did you and your mom have some fun, funny things happen or did it get so intense that it was hard to do that? I maybe go back a few years because it probably was pretty intense at the end. Yeah, the last 10 months were pretty intense, but we did, I'm trying to remember, we did have laughs and I right now I'm not pulling up a specific yeah, memory. Really but, fun. You know, it, and we, we're the kind of family, oh Lord, the little family, <laughs> <laughs> a little family history here. I don't know why and I, I hope we're not the only family that has this nasty habit but we can all be like okay it is thanksgiving we are not going to somehow discuss poop <laughs> or some very dinner and you know we'd all be like we're not discussing poop we're not discussing poop and the next thing you know we're just it's like how the hell did we get here who brought it up you know this is like so you know we're we're a pretty you know goofy family and i have you know, there's times, you know, when somebody would bring it up and it'd be like, okay, who brought that up? And so then it would just be funny because somehow that topic would come up organically. And I have a daughter with Crohn's disease, so it does come up organically more now. But <laughs> right. prior, she, you know, prior to her disease, because like now I've discussed that topic way more than I want, but you know, it's like, I don't know if it was the consistency of the chocolate pie or I don't know, <laughs> you know, we'd, we'd all be like, okay, now yeah, we're, we're, we're all in agreement. We're not going to discuss poop, right? Okay, right. Okay. And then of course the topic would get everybody laughing, which exactly. is, you Exactly. Know, and so that's just how, you know, that's the that's kind of thing, family. you know, we, you know, we loved watching the, well, she loved watching the kids. I enjoyed it because, you know, like, I think one of the last times we were in the park together was Veterans Day. So it was like November 12th, 2019. You know, because obviously at that point it started getting a little chilly. We're blessed to be able to sit in the park on November 12th. And I just remember putting my head back on the bench and looking at the sun coming through the trees and the trees, you know, blowing and listening to the kids screech and laugh and carry on and, and be kids. And it was just, it was really relaxing. And Those she loved cool. it. Those and are golden moments. Those are the ones that you're looking for. I do right. remember a funny moment and it wasn't, I think it was in February I was chatting with her and she made the comment that, well, my brothers are normal people now. I'm like, okay, your brothers are normal people now. And I'm thinking, what were they before? <laughs> I think I'm they were think, always normal. I'm thinking too, you know, um, I have one dear friend whose husband called her, I don't know if it was sister or something. It wasn't wife, but she really knew that he knew she was his special person. So I'm even thinking about that with you and your mom, you know, my good friend or my friend. She knew, she didn't have the word daughter, but she knew that relationship, which is nice to know because 
words can get confused. And in mm -hmm. fact, they still know that relationship with you. So anyway, that laughter was one that I wanted to mention because if you can pull that out, and I think for people home right now, there's a lot of funny shows you can watch and just recognize the humor and things and have a good laugh each day. That'll make the day go better. The next one that I have on my little list about this anger, and again, you're a good one to ask about this, is music came into our life. And I even find today, I not so much taking care of the grandchildren now, but when I did, even if things got a little antsy around here with grandchildren, if I just put on good music, it changed the whole mood in the house. And for me, you know, staying home as I am right now, and we get a little gray up here in the Northwest, and I can hit the afternoon and it's kind of like, I don't have a lot of energy, I'm not feeling particularly upbeat, go put music on and instantly it changes how I feel. So, you know, if you, especially with somebody with Alzheimer's can bring out some music they liked before and listen to it, it can really change things. Was there music in the care facility or music that you were able to there, use or music you liked? There was music in the care facility. A lot of times it was big band music. And my yes. mom was born in 1943. So, yeah. And I'm trying to remember, it always seemed like background noise. And it might have, it might have helped some of the residents, but I, my mom didn't connect to music. I tried multiple times. Right. And I was more successful when I started thinking about her mom and what my grandmother listened to when I was a kid. And so I have right. this really great video. I think it's from February of 2019 where I got her dancing to Nat King Cole's lazy, hazy, crazy days of summer. Nice. And I had to join in a little bit and I got my camera. So, you know, I didn't want to like, you know, I didn't want to make people seasick with the video. <laughs> right. And Cause right. I had my phone playing the music. I actually had to use my actual professional camera. So that was a whole different thing. And, you know, she enjoyed it, but she really liked talk radio. So I there think that if she had not developed Alzheimer's, I think she'd be totally into podcasts. Right, right. So no, I think I, you figure out what's right for them. And then people talk about them playing an instrument. Mike never played an instrument, so that wasn't going to happen. I did get a harmonica, and he kind of had fun with the harmonica, which was good. So I think you just figure out what works. And like you said, the talk radio. We did also, or I did also, put a limit to like the TV. So it wasn't just running all the time. So there, again, was part of the routine. It would be on for a little bit. And then there were other things. I was, you know, reading the, he liked the newspaper read to him or just getting out on the deck or taking a little ride or, you know, later when he was in a wheelchair, just even in a wheelchair in the kitchen while I cleaned up after doing the dishes. So um yeah changing things up a little bit but having a routine and not just letting the tv run continual i know with young babies you can have music on for them but if it's just there as you say it becomes background but if you turn it off and turn it back on again you have a better response than if you just left it on for hours so i think we took advantage of that sometimes with mike as well having that sort of in my back pocket being a parent education and educator and knowing about child development that was pretty you know that was kind of a big advantage i used that in lots of things i figured out how to do with mike that makes so, sense yeah i didn't i want to take a quick peek here and make sure that the things i was thinking about so under anger i'd written down the idea of making sure that you know there's a sleep and a routine talk a little bit about laughter mention music so those were all things and then you know, Mike, knowing me, we kind of talked about sort of briefly right at the beginning. And I, I guess we did cover that. So those were kind of some key points I just didn't want to lose as we were talking. Um, I'm trying to think of the other topics I was thinking about here that could be helpful for people at home. I'm wondering if they're able to connect with groups online. Do you know anything about that, Jennifer? Are there some, lines that are, some groups that are happening now online for people with Alzheimer's? Well, my support group in March was canceled. No, yes, yeah. And in April, we did a telephone meeting. And I think in May, we meet the second Tuesday of the month, Thursday of the month. And I think they're actually gonna try to do a Zoom call or, or they're, they're using a different app for meetings for their advocacy and their training. So they might use that instead of Zoom, but the same, same 
scenario. And I think that will help a lot because a lot of people in the telephone meeting were saying, we'd really like to be able to see faces oh, because, yes. you know, yes. there we're for better or worse, we're a very big group. Yes. And it's sometimes, you know, you might think, wait, I know, I know Rosalis's name, but I can't put her face to it. Or right. I think yeah. this is the gal or, you know, it's, and some of them were pretty new when, right. when we had to shift gears. So right. like one gal emailed me and she says, I think I know who you are. And so I tried to send her just a picture off my phone, but it didn't work that way. So I just like click stupid selfie. Yeah. This is me right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like no big deal. So I'm hoping the, the video meeting will mm -hmm. actually happen because I think that will be better. And I'm still, you know, I showed up in the phone meeting. I think it had only been like, nine days since my mom passed away that was and I, quick. yeah so i um you know i don't need to lose any more things it's like the caregivers in her residence you know i'm gonna i have to go back at some point sometime in the future box up everything in her room and get that donated because they didn't allow us to do that yet for because of the pandemic thing mm -hmm. and even though we're already there i don't really know why me showing up one more day was a big deal but I'm following the rules. I'm not always a rule follower, but it's like, whatever, like they can't move people in. So it's really, you know, it's they're like, keeping people out. Right. Yeah. They were very kind. They called me on Sunday, the 29th of March and said, mom's not doing well. We think she'd benefit from a visit from you. And I said, Oh, thank God. I said, it's been two weeks and I'm terrified. She's not going to recognize me even as her best friend. And then she won't trust me. And it's really going to be ugly for all of us. I said, mm -hmm. I've been trying, trying to be respectful of the rules. I said, but you guys were days away from me just busting through the door. <laughs> and so I showed up the next morning I talked to the hospice nurse. Mom was not awake, conscious. And so, and then she didn't look, I, I was pretty aware of the fact that I don't think we're going to the park in the wheelchair this summer. Um, so I, I said all the things that needed to be said. She didn't have to keep fighting. You know, she didn't have to, she did a good job. I, you know, and I, and I did make the joke that night. I'm like, she never listened to me before. So she'll probably miraculously recover at this point. And then the next day they called and said, you guys want to get down here. And my sister's like a half an hour away. I'm 15 minutes away. And her brother was like 45 minutes away. And all 10 family members ended up at the same time. And the poor executive director's like, um, um, uh, too many people here. And I'm like, don't worry about it. We're not going to do this to you again. <laughs> so that, you know, we had, we had some good blessings that way, but good. I didn't want to lose all these connections that I've had in the last three years. So I'm still right. attending my Alzheimer's caregiver support group for the time being. And it's good that, to know those groups are out there that, you know, they're still meeting and giving people that support because I think now people need it more than ever before. You know, it's, it's harder for them to get support in other ways. I mean, mm -hmm. just going out and about, you really can't take rides or walk your neighborhood. You can walk your neighborhood, but you can't go to the park. Some of the things that you described that were so nice. On the flip side of that, I want to be pretty positive about where the big picture is going with Alzheimer's today. It's pretty incredible. I'm connected with one group that's doing research on Alzheimer's and they're still progressing. they they figured out how they can keep up the research component. And the amazing thing is there's research going on around the world right now. And there's more money going into Alzheimer's research than in the past. So right now we don't have medication to stop the disease or prevent the disease. The medication that's out there does help people function better, but it doesn't stop the disease or the progression of the disease. So I think they're moving in the direction to have that happen. The other thing that is pretty exciting is now they've got comparative studies that have gone on where you have a control group that does certain things and another group that doesn't do it. And what they've discovered is it makes a difference and can slow the progression if you do certain things. And we've kind of heard about them, but I want to bump them up to everybody who's out there. One is the Mediterranean diet. You know, we've heard a lot about that. That's fruits and nuts and vegetables and they talk about eight to 11 servings a day, which is a lot when you start trying to figure out how you're going to get that in. But, you know, changing your diet around a little bit so it's more fruits, nuts, vegetarian uh, oriented. 
And then the other thing they do know is they know that social makes a difference, which is why the support groups are so important. So people who have a social component and connect with others, they progress slower. There's some really exciting things that are happening along that line. They're kind of on hold right now. But in our area, they have walking groups for dementia couples in particular. They go to the zoo. They have regular outings. They have movies that go on at a regular, you know, weekly movie people can attend. Uh, and, you know, discussions that go around that. So that's all real positive. And then the third one I want to mention is one that is kind of amazing to me because we asked about it during Mike's journey and we were told it wouldn't make any difference, but that's exercise. And, you know, I think we all know exercise is important in our life, but when we exercise, it stimulates our brain. So that's the walks, that's stretching, that's any kind of exercise at all. I had it an involvement with a gentleman who was quite elderly and he's had the diagnosis now for an extended period of time, way into his teens. Uh, when Mike was diagnosed, we'd heard probably about nine years. He lived nine and a half. And this fellow has been diagnosed way over 13, 14 years. It, it varies with everybody, but he and his wife are avid exercisers, you know, so they will use a stationary bike or they will walk their neighborhood. And uh, I'm pretty sure, and of course they're, they're slim trim, so I've got a feeling they're doing diet thing too, that those things are what have allowed him to continue on for the extended period of time. So that's great. The Alzheimer's Association online, you can see a line that says the first survivor is out there today, which is exciting because we know that we're getting closer to that. So it's gonna happen, but um, it's not here yet. It wasn't here in time for Mike. But I wish I'd known some of those things. We did a little bit with exercise, not enough. He'd never been an exerciser. It was hard to bring that into his life later. But even now, staying home, there's nice stretching things you can do or, you know, walks in your house, walk down the street if you're able to do that. So I just want to bounce up that there's a lot of hope out there. That is true. There is hope. And the whole point of exercising, stimulating your brain. Yes. I had a, I'm a cyclist and because of the weather and moving and mom challenges and all this stuff, I was off my bike a lot more in the beginning of 2020 than I would have liked. But there were days when it's like, I am getting on my bike and I am riding around until That's I feel standing. better because, you know, it's just, it's amazing. But there was one morning I rode, this is probably last fall. Um, on Mondays, I used to do a, like a little neighborhood circuit. And I, my goal was to see how I could, could I do this? relatively flat 15 miles faster because right. then it's like up this hideous hill to our old house Ugh. <laughs> we live in the flats now so it's kind of nice um but we're gonna have to get back into the hill climbing but this one day i'm riding and riding and riding and i'm like i don't know if i started earlier but i took a different route for some reason and i had more ideas for the podcast more things it was like yes. popcorn popping in my yes. brain yes. and i was like I need to stop because I need to write some of these right, down. You right. know, there was so many ideas. It's not, you know, it was, it wasn't two or three. It was like six or seven. And I'm like, I need right. one more idea. I'm not going to remember these other good ones. And that's going to frustrate me. And so I rode think, really fast till I was anaerobic, which means you're basically panting for breath because then your brain doesn't have time to come, come up with right. ideas. And that's also actually good for you. And then I had to ride up the icky hill home. And then I, I told my husband, like, oh, my God, I got all these ideas. Hang on a second. I jotted them all down. Right. And, and think about the person with Alzheimer's who is having, they're struggling with some of that stimulation to the brain, what it can do for them. And when you talk about bike riding, you know, that's something that couples really want to bring into their life now, too, is new things, you know, exciting things to look forward to. And, you know, if you're not depending upon what stage people are in in Alzheimer's, you don't have to close down and not have new hopes and new things to look forward to in the future. You can still plan on what's going to happen when we're out of stay at home, you know. Who knows, maybe somebody wants to order a bike that they can use inside, you know, or something new. I heard somebody that they were starting to take on a new exercise program because it comes on every day at a certain time and they're going to start trying to do this. So. Um, couples should have new things to look forward to, just like you talked about the bike and, and what that did for you. So no, one thing, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, well, okay. My husband and I have been riding together and he has said, cause he basically life got in the way and I kept saying, you have to just make it a, it, it's a priority. I yes. know, but work this, blah, 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 excuses, excuses. Well, 
he has a lot less work. He's a real estate broker. He does property management. And that's the only part of the business that's still going. Obviously, people aren't selling houses right now. Right. So, you know, he has a lot less busy work to do. And we finally got back on the bike and we're going out three days a week. Because nice. I was telling him, I'm like, you know, I'm already struggling with being you know, a little bit depressed about what's going on and mom dying and right. you know, like too many things happening at once here. I said, I really don't want to go out by myself. Normally I go Wednesday, Friday with a group and they were still going out. Um, I think they've decided that it's not really a great idea to go in. Right. They were riding six feet apart, but now there's this calculation on the faster you ride, the more apart you have to be. And I think they've <laughs> just all decided that that's just too much math. So they're just you know, they're, they're going to do their thing individually. And, but, be, and so he's noticing how much better he feels mentally and physically. And it's like, and, and we're, we're out and we're discussing, you know, things, big things. It is an opportunity to connect with your partner in a whole new way. And even with Alzheimer's couples, you can connect in a whole new way. One of the things I loved is we would have a little conversation every day and that again is something that you do in new relationships and you can forget. And we know that it's important, which is essentially what you're describing you and your husband are doing now. But you know, at some point, usually at the end of the day, I talk to Mike about our day. It could be a very simple day. Wasn't it nice we got a phone call from our daughter? Or boy, didn't that um, dinner taste good tonight? Or you know, wasn't it beautiful? The sun was out. Remember the bird we saw out the window? Just some little connecting about our day and what we had, or even talk about some of the emotions. That was pretty tough. You know, I wasn't very patient today. I'm sorry that happened. Or, you know, I think we were both tired when we were grumpy. Or, you know, just coming back and talking about it a little bit, which is what your bike riding is allowing you to do. And that's what long-term relationships do. Um, and so we have an opportunity to do that in a new way because we've got more time with each other. The one thing I want to do before we go, and I'm aware of our time, I just want to do a little reading from Mike and me, if I can. Oh, certainly. That would be fantastic. There's so many chapters, and to sort of a plug about the book, it is designed to be a guide. And so if somebody picks up the book, and you can get it at Amazon or your independent bookseller, they're still out there. Uh, you can look at the chapters, and if you want one to check out yelling or following or whatever your choice is, you can read it in any order. But the other thing that's really nice is it's got insights. So at the end of chapters, there's little insights. And the one I want to just pull out today, because I was trying to think of something that would be a nice little short reading. The chapter is 12 Unexpected Blessings This Late Stage. And I, I took that chapter because it was year nine. And year nine, I had no idea that the things that we did were still possible. I just sort of thought Alzheimer's, you know, things were pretty much coming to an end fairly soon. But we had seven really good years. Year eight was a little harder. But these are all things that happened in year nine, which were a surprise. So what I want to read to you, actually, though, are the insights right at the very end. And there's five insights that I want to read to you from this chapter. So number one, the biggest insight in the ninth year is that Mike was still Mike. He's still present with us, something I did not think would be possible in late Alzheimer's. As long as we reached out to him and continued to believe he was still with us, he could respond and reach out to us too. Two, it is easy to overlook that someone is still present when they can no longer interact in the way we are used to. Instead, watch closely for any signs of awareness and you too will be surprised and rewarded with the resulting response and connection. Read <laughs> three, do not disregard or discount the little signs that your loved one is still engaged and in love with you. Write them down so you can remember them in years to come. I'm so glad now that I kept a journal throughout our Alzheimer's journey. Four, stay open, even to the very end, to the positive things that might happen, rather than worry about the negative things that you've been told will probably happen. Expect good things to happen and they are very often will. Five, last but not least, focus every day on what your loved one can still do rather than fret about the things that he or she can no longer do. 
So a good reminder for us that, you know, with Alzheimer's, there's a lot of good things. And I have to say the nine things or the 12 things that we could do in year nine were a complete surprise to me because I had heard all the myths and the beliefs and I had bought into that. And really what I'm trying to say in the book is it doesn't have to be that way. Every situation's different. Everybody's journey is different. And yet there were so many things I did not expect to happen. And I know a lot of couples are staying home to see if they can do it at home and they don't know if they're gonna do it or, or need to make a move. And it all of course depends on the individual situation. But I just wanna let people have a little hope that you know you just might be able to finish this at home together. And that's what happened for us, which was pretty special. I also want to do one more shout out because I was going to do it at the beginning and I did not. Jennifer, your podcast is pretty wonderful. Thank you. And I was going to pop that in right at the beginning because before doing this one with you, I listened to a number of the segments and I'm so glad you're out there. And everyone I listen to, I, I pick some good tips up from everybody and uh, many of them were focused on people in care facilities and I thought that was wonderful. And it's fun to come on and focus a little bit more on people who are staying at home together right now because I know it's particularly challenging. So thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much. And I look forward to reading the rest of Mike and me. Not sure where it got stuck, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you guys were able to do it all at home because I know that is a big fear for a lot of people. And so your, your experiences and your insight should definitely help a lot of people and I appreciate it. Well, and I, and you know, we did it at home and it is, it is a we and in the book, I always talk about Mike and I, and so he's very present throughout the story and my journal notes are plugged in to give time frames where things happen. But the reality is it wasn't just me, it was a whole team, which I think is why my heart goes out to people who are at home because their team is probably a little different right now. You know, I did work one day a week, so I had somebody, first five, six years didn't have to, but later had somebody here with Mike when I was at work. And then certainly my daughter helped out with those earlier years. And so that whole team that you operate with, that changes, you know, yeah. right now and being able to get out and in the community. So I particularly am thinking of folks home with Alzheimer's right now. It is definitely a challenge for them. And I think there'll be a lot of interesting research finding out how this isolation is not good for people with cognitive, yes. you know, broken brains. Yes. Because I've had people reach out to me and they're like, OMG, I don't know what to do. Mom's getting worse and, or dad's depressed yes. or whatever. And it's scary. And it's like, and I'm barely on the other side right now. Right. <laughs> kind of straddling right. two worlds. So it's like, I don't really have a lot of good advice yet. And, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of these people this is a permanent change in their ability that was brought on quicker because of our shelter in place mandates. And that's sad. You know, there are, there are slips, you know, where you sort of are going along and then things dip down and it's a new normal. And, you know, I tried to pick up as many points as I could cover in an hour. I mean, how much can you say it's a 300 page book, but I, I really, you know, I'm so excited about the book because everybody who's picked it up has come away with some things I have a friend who they're now dealing with Lou Gehrig's disease and uh, she had read it early on just because she's a friend and now they're reading it in a whole different way. And they've said, oh gosh, it's made such a difference to just take, you know, certain chapters at certain times. It speaks to them at a different time because it is a guide. So I know that it is there and making a difference to people, learning what you can do to make it a little bit easier. So I wanted to talk about music and laughter today because I think people need to remember that and not to be critical of their loved one, tell them what they're doing right. And I looking at another little note I made, I got a minute, so I'll bounce that up. Mike was pretty incredible here. You know, we're talking about what I did, but Mike did his part once he made up his mind and even late, he could put his hand out and pat my hand or give me a little smile or pucker up for a kiss. And that was just as great as me saying to him what a good job he did, because he was telling me that he appreciated me. So for those of you who are watching this as a couple, the person with Alzheimer's, you've got to do your part too. You know, you've got to let the other person know what a great job they're doing. That's their reward after a hard day's work. Well, that's a great place to end, because I know, like with my mom, she's like, I don't want to be a burden on you girls. Mike didn't want to be a burden on you. And so that is how you can help not be a burden. 
and just be pleasant and joyful and appreciative. We all need that appreciation. A little Definitely. hug, a little kiss, a smile. That's a big deal. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you, Jennifer. It's been fun. All right. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.